Hello, in this second video, I would like to continue talking about the management of the crisis. I mean, the sobering the crisis of the 1980s. First, let me share my screen. Okay. I think we ended uh, on this slide. Uh, we were talking about how the situation was different in the case of Colombia. So, the initial stage of the crisis, uh, I mean, the after the way of the falls, after the situation got worse, we will face another stage of the crisis. Basically, what we will see is an escalation uh, or the, the, the situation substantially uh, worsened it in the second half of the 1980s. And the main reason why we will have um, worsening in the situation here is because Latin American countries will face a era of high inflation in some cases or directly hyperinflation. We can see on this figure the evolution of the inflation rates. We have here the monthly inflation rate for Mexico between 1970 and 1990. You can see how inflation accelerated uh, with the onset of the crisis, there was an initial reduction here, but in the second half of the 1980s, uh, the um, um, uh, inflation rate uh, picked up and uh, moved over uh, 100, uh, I think that more, 150%, and that was followed by um, an important decline. But the point is that and if we need to make a description of the second half of the 80s in several uh, countries in Latin America in, and in a more broad perspective, uh, what is uh, following the initial stage of the crisis, basically what we have is a major increase in inflation and in some case, uh, hyperinflation. The situation in Mexico um, was really complicated. What we have here is a really high inflation rate, but the situation was even worse in the case of Brazil. So notice, for instance, that in the, in the case of Brazil, so we are moving uh, into a different scale. So here, I mean, an inflation of almost 200% is, is, is terrible, but the situation in Brazil got uh, even worse. And we can see that we are here in a different scale, so we are talking about inflation rates of a uh, 400-500 percent. So basically, what we have here is a major deterioration, and uh, actually, is a collapse of the Brazilian currency. So the situation here was really bad, but got even worse uh, in in 1990. So Brazil will have high hyperinflation that. Um, essentially will lead to the collapse of the Brazilian currency. We have here some episodes of hyperinflation. Uh, even before the, the, um, the, the crisis, there were some present of hyperinflation in the region, of course. We have a uh, hyperinflation in the case of Argentina in 1976, uh, both during the, um, the, the 80s. So we can see how uh, in 1984, there was uh, again a uh, major uh, deterioration of the Argentinian currency, another way of hyperinflation. Um, uh, the, um, the most complicated one that came in 1989. We are talking about uh, an inflation rate of uh, basically higher than uh, 3,000%. So this is. Um, over any um, uh, so over any standard uh, that could be um, considered a um, um, uh, uh, still under uh, the control of um, monetary authorities. A similar episode of hyperinflation is what we have in the case of Bolivia. So we have um, a hyperinflation that lasted actually for two years. So it was more prolongated. So I have here like two different episodes, but 
is essentially the same. So my hyperinflation decay of Bolivia started in 1984 and continued over 1985. Um, in the case of Brazil, so this is the what we uh, showed before, how uh, the situation really deteriorated in the late 1980s. Uh, um, basically, again, so this is the, the same uh, hyperinflation. It's just that um, what you have is um, a further deterioration in 1990. Uh, uh, similarly, in the case of Brazil, in the case of Peru, so we have another episode of hyperinflation. So this is just some of the, uh, of the so some pictures for the Brazilian currency at the time. So you can see, for instance, uh, how the Brazilian currency, the, the Cruzeiros, um, changed very quickly from in, in terms of denomination. So we are talking here about a bill of a, one single digit and how in a relatively short period of time, so we start to see um, bills circulating with denominations over a uh, four digits. So what we have here is an accelerated deterioration. But what is more interesting, uh, what is even more interesting for the Brazilian currency is this stand that you can maybe notice here in the center of the bill. Um, so that stand that uh, says uh, Banco Central. And uh, if you read the stand, so you can notice here how the stand says that uh, we are talking about a uh, Crusaders nose or new Crusaders. Basically what we have here is a replacement of a former currency that it was called just Crusaders. Basically, what we have the, the collapse of the Crusaders, and like the speed of deterioration, or like the speed of the um, losing of pushing power of the Brazilian currency was so accelerated. So there was not even time to uh, launch a new currency or to print a new kind of piece. So, uh, because the, is, the, the situation is de deteriorating um, very rapidly. So what we have here is that uh, the only option that the central bank have was basically to um, put an stand on the bills and uh, try to, to sell uh, those bills to, to the markets in order to uh, uh, try to uh, maintain uh, some kind of, of management or control of the situation. But as you can see, so that uh, really didn't work. And this is why uh, uh, you see uh, even further deterioration uh, that follow with the initial stage of a uh, hyperinflation in Brazil. So if you are doing so that you are just stamping a bill uh, in order to try to regain credibility, of course, uh, there is no any, any chance that uh, a central bank or a government uh, succeed in that kind of policy. So uh, basically what we have here is an um, absolute repudiation uh, of the Brazilian currency by, by the policy. So uh, central bank lost completely his credibility. This is another example. It's basically the, the same. So this is a, another version of a, a Brazilian currency. So what we have here is a, the, the cruzados, but the situation was essentially the same. So that um, that currency lost credibility, lost credibility very quickly, and uh, basically what government trying to do in order to preserve some control over the, the monetary policy was to stamp um, um, those currencies with uh, this stand that we can see here. That uh, basically what that means is that uh, that bill that was already originally printed uh, for. 5,000 uh, cruzados. So now the actual value of that currency was uh, just five uh, new cruzados. But uh, uh, as you can as you can imagine, so that uh, was a complete failure. I think that we have another example here for the case of Bolivia. is is the same. So what we have is a bill of a, a high denomination. We have a um, a here a bill of um, 50,000 um, uh, Bolivian pesos that basically 
uh, was stamped for only uh, five cents. So uh, before to talk about the end of the crisis, so as you can uh, imagine the reason behind hyperinflation is that um, the situation of an unsolved crisis prolongated and Latin American countries continue running high fiscal deficit because they have no um, uh, the option to fund that deficit via external loans anymore. So basically the only remaining uh, option for them was to uh, try to compensate uh, that uh, deficit via an increase in, in, the, in the money supply, basically by an expansionary uh, monetary policy. Um, well, uh, what's going on here is that central banks uh, funded government in that policy and that ended with a complete collapse of the Latin American currencies. Okay, so finally, for this session, let's talk about the end of the crisis. So what we have is that finally in the late 80s, we have, we start to see the beginning of the end. So what we have is the so-called the, the Bradley plan uh, uh, that was launched in 1989. Uh, the name of the, of the plan uh, is after the secretary of the treasury at that time. Um, actually, the Bradley plan was not very different from the um, from the previous plan, the um, uh, Baker plan that we uh, mentioned before. So it was quite similar. It was essentially a combination between French loans and some reforms, but there were some important differences. And uh, the main difference uh, that we can identify here is that. In the late 80s, it was obvious that what happened in Latin America, it was not just a problem of liquidity. What happened in Latin America, it was a problem of solvency. So that means that something structural uh, was wrong in Latin American economies. And if that was the assessment, so that means that the solution also would be different in the sense that it was not just only a matter to in gaining access again to international capital markets. So in that case, what Latin American countries needed to do is to implement a structural reforms. So um, basically what um, the, the, the core of the, of, the, of the Brady plan was a combination between a new way of conditional loans, a risk scheduling in 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 payments, so basically try to improve um, the, 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 the the conditions um, of the um, sovereign debt um, uh, for Latin American countries. But all that um, new resource were conditional to structural reforms. What the structural reforms actually mean? So a uh, structural reforms we can I mean it's an oversimplification. We need to, uh, to to discuss more uh, on details every single aspect of structural reforms. I think that uh, my colleague Angel uh, will talk a, a little bit about that uh, in the um, in our next uh, lecture. But the structural reform oversimplifying was a combination between macroeconomic stability and economic liberalization. So that was the the theoretical uh, concept behind structural reforms, but in practicality, that means the end of the import substitution industrialization. What we have here at the end of the day is that the import substitution industrialization in Latin America started with a crisis, started with the Great Depression, and also ended with a crisis that was the um, sovereign debt crisis of the 1980s. We can also try to answer a couple of questions re uh, related um, to this and is why policymakers in or Latin American economies or policymakers in, in the region were keener to implement structural reforms in the late um, 80s than in the early 80s. So basically why after waiting for almost a decade 
to try to solve it to try to solve this problem. So finally, policymakers uh, were more open to do so. And probably uh, this is a combination between uh, the realization that um, something was fundamentally wrong in, in the Latin American economic model. So basically, uh, it was evident that uh, all the problems associated with the import institutionalization, and uh, also it was evident that Latin American economies wanted to succeed they needed to try something different. So there was a, a combination between external pressure, and a change in the intellectual ambience in, in Latina, Latin America, but also there was a major fundamental change in Latin American institution. Uh, what we have here is a new wave of democratization. So the um, sober debt crisis will mean not only the end of the import substitution socialization model, but also in several cases, the end of the military dictatorships or other authoritarian regimes that characterize Latin America. We have uh, uh, that in the case of South, South America, we have uh, that several countries in that region um, were essentially military dictatorships in the in the 70s and in the early 80s so um, the 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 crisis also means the collapse of those authoritarian uh, regimes so this is just um uh this slide to so try to summarize in uh, the the kind of reforms that came with the with the um, uh, with the Brady plan, uh, again, so um, in, in our next lecture, so uh, my colleague will talk more about this, but um, uh, some of, of the elements that we can highlight here is um, essentially that combination between um, partial trade and financial liberalization. So we will see that also the implementation of that it will be complicated. We will have a lot of difference uh, between countries in the region. No? All countries will implement um, that uh, the, 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 these reforms with the same intensity. Um, but another uh, important element here is that in the package of structural reforms, of structural reforms, we can include. Um, also the end of the state of the enterprises that we started our letter talking about that. So basically trying to elaborate why these companies were so important uh, in, in explaining and understanding the sovereign the crisis. And if we conclude that what we have here is a problem of solvency, it's not just a problem of liquidity, so one of the major reforms that uh, were asked by um, multilaterals and well, also um, policymakers were, were, were also convinced that they, need, they needed to move in that direction was, um, was privatization. So what we have here is not only the, the, the collapse of um, the import substitution socialization model, but also what we will see is a major change in that trend of um, increasing the share of the state-owned enterprises in Latin American economies. I just um, wanted to, um, to close um, this session with a couple of features. So this is a, the, the steel work that we showed um, in our previous lecture when we were talking about the, the rise and the consolidation of the import institution industrialization. What we can see here is that a, that uh, uh, steel company um, basically um, closed in in the 80s. So you can see that in Puntidora de Hierro y Acero de Monterrey closed finally in 1986. We have a, another example of a, a stay in all it in enterprises that fundamentally changed during during the 80s 
in that in this case, in the case of, of, of Dina, um, it was known it was not that this company uh, closed. Basically, what happened is that it was transformed and essentially was privatized. So part of all, uh, the privatization of that kind of company uh, needed to be understood in the context of the reforms that um, were envisioned like a solution uh, for the uh, 1980s uh, crisis. This is just the, the evolution of the TFP that even with all these um, uh, uh, problems that we had mentioned, it, so it's important to still bear in mind that we are talking uh, about a period of um, really poor performance in terms of productivity. So notice that during the dead uh, late growth era um, or during the, the, the crisis, productivity actually declined in, in Latin America. So it's like, uh, this is an, an, an important reason to believe that something structurally wrong was, was here. So that's something uh, uh, more than just a problem of liquidity uh, was behind the, the, the crisis. And uh, this is just a contrast uh, in the evolution of the of productivity for Latin American economies and how we can contrast that with the evolution of productivity for the US, uh, uh, which would expect uh, a more moderate evolution of the TSP in the case of the US, because we are talking about an economy that is on the technological frontier, uh, but even in, in that case of so the, the evolution is positive and um, that contrasts with the negative a uh, trend that we cannot serve for Latin American uh, countries. Okay, our final session, session in this um, uh, lecture will be about the, the way of democratization that came in the late 1980s or in the second half of the 80s. Democratization um, occurred in the context of the worsening or in the context of the 1980 crisis. So um, basically the, the, um, the crisis is also um, a, a part of the collapse of the authoritarian regimes in the, in the region. And uh, if we need to, um, to remark something positive for Latin America during this period, of course, uh, that positive point is democratization. Uh, uh, basically what we have is the, a new era of democratic governments in the, the region. So uh, democratization is very related with what it was thought like the package or the set of reforms that were needed to propel Latin American economies. Well, this is uh, what some people call the, the Washington Consensus. Um, basically, it's a combination between um, stability in macroeconomies um, or macroeconomic stability and um, an economic liberalization for international trade and for the financial sector. So what we will see is that the implementation of those reforms was very complicated uh, at the beginning because uh, we need to understand this in a context of, um, of the initial stage of, um, of uh, these new regimes. So basically, we are in a context of a still of political fragility in the second half of the 80s. It will gain also the problem of hyperinflation. So in the second half of the 80s, so the implementation of that package reform was very complicated. We will see a more clear uh, pathway toward uh, that target that we can associate with the reforms proper from the Washington Consensus in the 1990s. Uh, the situation was complicated, so democratic governments were already consolidated. Um, in, policymakers at the time opted for uh, that uh, kind of economic model uh, in an effort to basically to uh, uh, left behind all the problems from, from the 1980s. 
basically, um, uh, there was almost a consensus in the region that something uh, different um, um, needed uh, in terms of um, economic management in the, in the region. Or basically, the region needed a new economic model. And uh, uh, that economic model was associated with a structural reform. This is just a measurement that we have seen in our previous lecture about the, this approach in, about how a democratic or autocratic a government is and the, the, the lower the score, the higher the authoritarian, uh, uh, the, the, the level of, of, the, of the authoritarian regime. So what we have here is that in the case of Argentina, so we have the, the dictatorship also in the case of Brazil, uh, Chile, Paraguay, uh, Peru, and Uruguay. Uh, as I mentioned before, so um, we have several of countries, or basically most of countries in the case of South America, uh, that um, uh, were under uh, uh, these autocratic uh, regimes. We can contrast the situation in the 70s and in the early 80s with the situation in the, um, the second half of the 80s. So we can see how um, uh, the crisis um, so in the collapse of uh, those regimes. Um, we see the transition toward democracy in several countries, uh, starting with uh, Argentina, but also in the same happened in the case of Brazil, uh, and later in the case of Paraguay and Chile. So I wanted to, um, uh, uh, to elaborate a little bit more about, about this, about, uh, um, about this political transition and how that way of democratization is associated with the implementation of a structural reform. So we mentioned that in the second half of the 80s, so it was probably more difficult uh, to implement structural reforms because um, it was just the beginning of the of the um, a new democratic governments. But once they consolidated, they um, implemented um, uh, those uh, reforms, and this is what we can see here. So this is a it's an index of structural reform uh, that basically tried to capture how countries implemented uh, those reforms that uh, usually scholars associated with um, the so-called Washington Consensus. And we can see that the, the pit of, of, of the reforms or of the, the, the reform in Iran um, was uh, at some point in the, in the late 80s and in the early 90s. So it was basically part of what was thought like the solution um, to overcome the uh, sovereignty crisis. But um, I think that uh, my colleague Angel will talk more about this in uh, the following lecture. Okay, so finally, I would like to talk a little bit about the democratic transition in, in some countries in the region. So we have the case of Argentina. We have here a picture of President Raul Alfonsín, uh, who was the um, the, the first elected democratic president uh, since the, the, the return to the to democracy. Um, his period was between 1983 up to um, uh, uh, 89. Actually, he um, uh, ended um, uh, his government before uh, the established uh, period because uh, there was a uh, a complicated economic situation basically it was because it was in, uh, uh, there was anticipated election because of the hyperinflation that came in um, in 1989. So in the Argentinian case, what we have is that Alfonsín initially uh, followed an heterodox approach. So instead of uh, moving in the direction um, that was established by initially by the Baker plan and uh, later by the by the predict plan. Um, Alfonsini tried something different. So he followed with um, an expansionary um, 
a, 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 a package of a spatiality, monetary, and fiscal policies. Uh, he launched, um, uh, I mean, in, in the context that, that um, failed, he tried to preserve the, um, the credibility of the Argentinian currency uh, with uh, those plans, the Austral and the, and the Spring plan. Both, uh, of course, that, that failed. Um, uh, the output that was uh, hyperinflation um, um, a substantial hyperinflation that um, uh, led to anticipated election and basically by, uh, led to his resignation in 1989. So finally, monetary stability in the case of Argentina was achieved uh, in the early 90s uh, when um, a new government, um, uh, or, or the new government of President uh, Carlos Menem implemented the convertibility uh, program. We have a, a couple of pictures more here. Uh, this is the case of Brazil. So what we have uh, here is the a picture of, of President um, Jose Sardin, who was the first president um, of the first uh, democratic elected president uh, of, of that country that uh, faced a similar challenge to um, um, those of Alfonsin. Uh, also, you have the hyperinflation of Brazil, but uh, what we will see is that um, a second democratic government uh, um, uh, of, of President um, Color de Melo and later uh, President Cardoso will implement it. Um, the reforms that uh, we uh, try to summarize uh, on these uh, people. This a picture of President um, uh, Sanguinet in the case of Uruguay, uh, a situation very similar. And finally, I would like to conclude with a picture of President um, Patricio Elwin, uh, who was the, the first democratic uh, elected president in the case of Chile. In the case of Chile, um, uh, I think that is, I mean, the case of Chile, I think that is relevant because it's a closure of, uh, of uh, it's, a, it's a closure of all uh, those military dictatorships that um, characterize Latin America in the second half of the 20th century. So I think that um, uh, what we have here is um, a closure for all that uh, period that uh, uh, was the, uh, not just terrible in terms of um, economic progress, economic development, uh, but also was so problematic in terms of, of democracy. Uh, the, the 1980s was um, a really complicated period, a really bad period for um, Latin American economic history. I would like to finish um, this letter. Um, we, this table we can see here, this is from a, a null article uh, by Remer that basically uh, the idea behind this article is trying to answer if authoritarian governments um, are keener to implement a, reforms in this case, uh, they are evaluating uh, basically um, 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 uh, expenditure reduction or uh, uh, adjustment in, in, in expenditure under the standby agreements. So this is the, the agreements between uh, the IMF and uh, countries. And uh, basically they are contrasting uh, uh, the um, the the willingness of uh, democratic, uh, democratic and authoritarian governments to implement uh, um, those standby agreements, and they are trying to evaluate if uh, maybe is there any difference in, in in the sense that you can maybe think that if an authoritarian regime have no accountability, so um, they could be a keener to uh, reduce expenditure. And what is interesting, uh, and the reason because I think that this article is interesting is because what you can see on the result is that um, that was not the case. So basically 
uh, you can see that um, uh, on average, um, um, you have a major increase in, in, in government expenditure on the authoritarian regimes that uh, on their democratic regimes. So basically the idea here is that they, they are evaluating the standby agreements uh, between the IMF and Latin American countries uh, between 1954 and 1984. And basically what they found is that uh, democratic governments uh, were keener um, to um, 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 or were well, yeah, we, we, we're working in, um, in managing uh, fiscal policy, uh, in, uh, in managing fiscal policy in a more sustainable way that authoritarian regimes. So basically, uh, this is just to make um, a, a comparison uh, and trying to relay reforming and uh, democracy. So I think that this is an interesting table to finish. Uh, this lecture and to see how a uh, structural reform that came in the 80s, in the late 80s and in the early in, uh, 90s are uh, strongly associated with the um, new wave of democratization that came into the region at that time. Thank you.